Welcome to the CTSC webinar for July 25, 2016. Today's topic is Exceeds Information Sharing with CTSC's James Marsteller. Jim is the CISO at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, uh, and CTSC is the NSF, NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And these webinars are a part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about the CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box here. And uh, we also will accept questions after the presentation as well. Having addressed the introduction, I will hand the mic over to Jim. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. I uh, just wanted to test my audio. Um, can everyone hear me well? Excellent. OK. Uh, thank you. So as Jeanette had mentioned, my name is uh, Jim Marsteller. I am the um, Chief Information Security Officer for the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And I'm also uh, involved, deeply involved with the security uh, team for the Exceed project. And that's what I'll be talking about today, giving you uh, just a brief introduction to the Exceed program and talk about some of the information sharing um, capabilities we have within the, the, the project. And um, without further ado, let's get started. OK, so just for the agenda, I'm going to give you a background on the Exceed security team, You know what our goals and our missions are, the structure of the team, um, some of the, the events that transpired that kind of shaped us over the, the years. Uh, I'll also touch upon some of the policies and procedures that have been instrumental in having a, a strong security program uh, within the Exceed project, and also talk a little bit about our incident response program. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to um, put them in the chat room. Um, if uh, Jeanette, if, if I don't see a question, just uh, chime in. Uh, it's kind of difficult to see you know, all the windows on my screen here. Um, so just to start off, uh, you know, our mission and goals for the Exceed security team um, is to support uh, the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of all of the Exceed resources services and data. Of course, in our field, uh, I think most, it's open science. You know, we, we uh, encourage the open sharing of our research and our data. Um, and often, sometimes, that comes at the uh, sacrifice. Some people think that security is not an issue. Um, but in fact, you know, integrity of your research data is, is very critical. Um, and that's one of our primary objectives within uh, the Exceed security team. Some of the activities that we uh, conduct uh, within the project is we do an annual risk assessment. Um, we do, well, not annual, but we do uh, one and then we do a refresher every year or so and do a complete um, a new risk assessment a review every two years. Um, this is to look at our policies to make sure we've got the right controls in place, to identify new threats that may have uh, developed over uh, the period of time. Uh, we also try to establish best practices uh, within the project. And we have some documents, some procedures that help us uh, afford that uh, initiative. And then as with any large project, there's new processes that come uh, into play. We have new software that gets rolled out into production. And the Exceed um, security staff plays an active role in those uh, reviews. We do design security reviews, operational reviews. Uh, so we just have an eye from the perspective of security when it comes to these new technologies and processes that roll out. Um, we also look at new technologies that might be applied to help improve the security of, the, of our project. Uh, recently, an example of this is the use of two-factor authentication for end users. Uh, we looked at a number of different technologies, and it's something we've rolled out um, just uh, in, within the past year. We use Duo two-factor authentication for end users to give them that additional um, layer of security to protect their account and their profile. 
Um, we also try to foster teamwork among the, the security staff and our other working groups. So there's many working groups within the Exceed project, accounting, uh, networking. So we, we coordinate with them when it comes to uh, important topics. Um, we also are in charge of doing a user education when it comes to information security. In fact, I just conducted one last week at the Exceed 16 conference, which was in Miami. We had our Monday tutorials, and we do an introduction to information security that goes over um, some of the basics, and I'll touch upon them later on in the session. Uh, and I think that's about it for this slide. We'll move ahead. So let's take a look at the Exceed Security Organization. We have the Exceed Security Office, and that's shared by two individuals. Um, uh, I am the lead, I co-lead along with Adam Slagle from NCSA. We um, are in charge of uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the security team and the incident response team. So we're uh, responsible for making sure that uh, you know, any project management that for tasks that need to be um, worked on by our team, we're responsible for driving them. Uh, doing our quarterly reports, uh, communicating to the Exceed management about critical security issues. Um, so that's a position that is shared by both Adam and I, and it's uh, worked out really well. Uh, for redundancy, if one of us is you know, away for vacation or just uh, out of pocket, the other one can fill in. It's worked out really well for us. Um, then next is the security working group. And the security working group is, um, it consists of the different service providers. So the Exceed project has uh, different service providers that um, either offer HP, HPC uh, resources to the, to the community or data storage services to the community. And each one of those service providers has a seat uh, within the security team. So right now we have about 10 representatives from each of the security, uh, the service providers that um, uh, coordinate security with their own local site. Uh, and our responsibilities include operational security, so making sure that we've got the right uh, security baseline in place for our resources, uh, dealing with any type of incident response that may come up, um, developing policies and procedures. This is very key that we get the input of all of the parties involved to make sure that we can have a successful um, uh, program or policy get into place. And then I did mention the design security reviews we do with our um, uh, SDNI group that help uh, review new software and new processes before they go into production. And then finally, our, our last group uh, is called the Cybersecurity Trust Group, and I sometimes call this our alumni group. So often within the project, um, you know, you'll have different organizations that will come and they'll participate and for whatever reason, either funding or otherwise, they, they uh, you know, um, retract from the project. But their security team has really found it valuable to continue to be plugged into our community. And they have asked to, to be able to uh, continue at least attending our incident response calls that we have weekly. And it's worked out really well. And as such, we have uh, organizations like CERN, LIGO, and NERSC, which don't have direct ties to exceed, but their security staff have, and they do participate in these weekly calls. And um, it's been well received by all those involved in our, our uh, IR team really um, works well with these additional resources from outside the project. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of our history of the security team, we formed in January 2004. And at that time, the Exceed project was known as the TerraGrid project. It was um, the one that preceded Exceed. And we had just uh, formed a, a straw man organization, at least for the security team. You know, contact information, how do we get in touch with people, uh, should something happen. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess you could say, we did have uh, enough of a structure in place. We had the uh, staccato incidents, which um, you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about it, you can Google FBI case 216. Uh, it was a hacker who broke into a number of different R&E uh, facilities within the United States, as well as government facilities, NASA, White Sands, uh, and even commercial uh, private companies like Cisco. Um, so when this happened, we had a foundation in place that we were able to uh, communicate and share information, and it worked out quite well. And over that time, though, since then, we've really matured our program and have developed quite a, a, a robust uh, series of, of governance documents that help us 
um, with our day-to-day -day operations. We have our security work group charter, and this kind of uh, is just lays our, you know, what, what our goals are. Uh, our acceptable use policy, so for each user that gets an Exceed account, they'll be presented with this acceptable use policy, which they have to acknowledge and uh, comply with. Um, we have the Exceed security playbook, so when something does happen, we have instructions for the first responders, what you need to do, um, information about you know, what type of uh, information can you share, what kind of communication or information sharing guidelines do we have. How do we communicate to the Exceed management? How do we communicate to our funding agencies? Um, all that's outlined in our security playbook. We also have the security working group SP guide and FAQ. So as I mentioned, sometimes we have new institutions and organizations that join the project. This is a, a, a guide that can help them understand how the, the team works and what our meetings are and how we interact, um, different communication methods. Um, that's all in our, 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 uh, our service provider guide. I had mentioned uh, the, the uh, need for baseline security. Um, so we have a uh, baseline security standards document. And this uh, is a guide for anyone that's, uh, any organization that is offering an Exceed Central uh, service. So uh, you know, some of the things uh, require two-factor authentication for admin, remote admin access to a resource, uh, different types of accounting requirements, uh, vulnerability scanning, that type of information. That's in our uh, baseline security standards. Um, and just uh, within the past few years, we've also developed uh, a Science Gateway security policy. So if you're not familiar with Science Gateways, it's a, a very successful um, initiative that came out of uh, um, uh, TerraGrid and Exceed to offer HPC or Exceed resources to a much broader um, audience. And these are usually fronted by a web server, a web portal on the front end. And a lot of these started popping up, and you know, a lot of the people that administer these had said, you know, is there any type of guidance the security team could give us to make sure that we're applying uh, proper security to our science gateway? And that's what we came up with this policy. Uh, we also have uh, different levels of service providers. Uh, level one is the one that uh, is the most critical. These are um, usually organizations that have a dedicated network connection. They have a significant resource that's uh, available on the Exceed um, uh, network. And we have a security agreement with them. This kind of sets expectations as far as um, how they apply security to their resources, how they communicate with the security team over certain incidents. Um, and then finally, the last uh, and probably one of our newest policy is the Exceed uh, privacy policy. And uh, this uh, just was implemented within the past year or so. Um, and I should mention that all of these policies are available. They're public. You can find them on the Exceed portal. Uh, or if you'd like more information at the end, I've got my email address. I'd be happy to connect you with uh, a location so you can look at these policies. OK, we'll move along. So some of the early lessons we, we learned from the uh, staccato incidents is that uh, rapid, secure communication is really critical. And uh, I'll, I'll emphasize the secure communications. Um, so I had mentioned early on we had a way for us to, to communicate uh, via uh, mailing lists, and we also had an IR room. Um, what we didn't realize is that at the time we didn't, they were not encrypted and there was a, a potential or we had uh, examples of where an attacker was eavesdropping on our communications. Um, so that was a lesson that we learned very quickly and immediately after that we um, started using um, PGP for our email communications, um, secure uh, message rooms and, and chat instant messaging so that we could share this information. And we also have a secure wiki that's operated by the security staff uh, for us to share uh, incident and event information. Um, so that was an early lessons learned. So one of the uh, uh, things I'd mentioned is our incident response team. Uh, we have a weekly response call. These are on Mondays at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, we have a 24-hour security hotline that any service provider can initiate should they need to. We have incident uh, mailing lists. I mentioned the encryption, encrypted communications. Uh, and there's been times in the past where we have to coordinate evidence gathering. Um, you know, back in 2004, 
when we had law enforcement involved, we had to coordinate the collection of a lot of this security event data so that law enforcement could uh, use that in uh, proceedings against the, the attacker. And you know, this is important because there's a dollar value associated with it that uh, has different uh, consequences for the attacker. And then we also, I mentioned the incident response tracking we have on our secure wiki. So all of these uh, make up our, our tools that we use for the incident response team that's within Exceed. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the weekly IR cars, uh, IR incident response calls. Uh, I mentioned here our alumni group, our grandfathered uh, service providers that contribute, uh, Lonnie, or I'm sorry, uh, LIGO, NERSC. Um, uh, they are welcome to join. It's a very tight-knit group. The trust among uh, the participants are, are is very strong. And these calls can last anywhere from five minutes. We'll get on the phone and we'll go around and just share any noteworthy information about new attacks that we've seen or someone might see some unusual activity and say, is anyone else seeing that? And this call can last anywhere from five minutes if there's not much to talk about or up to 45 minutes to an hour, depending upon if it's a busy week. Uh, we'll also discuss new vulnerabilities that may have been uh, discovered in the past week. It is a closed participant list. So only people that uh, are authorized have the call information. And when you join the call, you have to identify yourself. And then you're challenged to make sure that that person is who they say they are. Um, and uh, we'll also get updates on different sites. Uh, and, and very often, the information that's uh, shared, uh, the security in, uh, events, aren't related to Exceed, but it might be something at their local institution. So it gives us some insight what other peers are seeing um, within their organization, and it allows us to be prepared to monitor for that um, within our own local site. So it's a, a very, very useful call. Uh, the hotline that I mentioned, it's um, available 24-7. Uh, any site can initiate this. It's, again, also only known to the res response personnel. Um, it's an 800 number, uh, so you don't, there's no charge for it. And it's also, um, we have international access, because you know, a lot of us um, occasionally find ourselves uh, traveling. And the ability to join one of these calls uh, from an international uh, number is, is very important. Uh, another tool that we have is the response playbook. I mentioned this earlier. Um, this tells you who and how to contact um, should something happen. We have guidance for initial responders, for our secondary response responders. Help desk staff, that's another really key important um, um, group that you need to make sure that they're aware of what's going on. Your uh, help desk is the ones that get calls from your users. You need to make sure that they have the right information so they can coordinate with the user. And as I mentioned too, reporting guidelines. Uh, we pretty much have a strict policy that no one is to talk to the press. Um, uh, privacy, you don't share uh, in incident information outside of our security team without the approval from um, the party that's involved. And then also uh, funding sources. And this is something that's really important if you uh, have an NSF grant or you're funded by uh, an agency, it's always good to have a conversation with your program officer in advance to a security event to find out exactly when they want to be notified. You know, they probably don't want to be notified at 3 in the morning if there's a compromised account. But if a large HPC system gets uh, rooted, you know, that might warrant their attention. So you want to make sure that you have those uh, conversations with your funding uh, agencies in advance. Um, so some other things too is we have uh, certain expectations when it comes to our service provider. Should they have, uh, let me just back up here too and say, um, so we have many different sites, each of which have their own resources. We deem a, an exceed security event as one that affects a critical exceed resource or a security event that uh, starts at one service provider and then um, expands to another service provider. So it affects two or more individual service providers. Or if it affects an exceed central service, we consider that an exceed event. Um, so when something does happen at a service provider, now there's certain things that we um, expect for them to communicate. 
you know, obviously the hosts that were affected. What was the nature of the security event? Was it uh, a remote vulnerability that allowed them to, to gain some type of compromise? Uh, was it a local vulnerability? Um, any type of uh, logging information that can help us detect a similar attack at other locations? Uh, bad SSH keys that may have been exposed, uh, certificates that may um, need to be uh, revoked. So this is the type of information that we expect the sites to share, and um, it's been very useful. Uh, likewise, if uh, this originated from a compromised user account, there's a, a questionnaire that we ask the user to fill out. Uh, and this is an example of some of the questions that we ask the user. You know, do they share their passwords with other accounts? When was your last known login? What locations do you normally log in so that we can monitor for uh, uh, IP addresses that might be uh, out of the norm? Uh, so once we get these informa this information from uh, the user, we can then determine whether or not we're satisfied that the, the initial threat has been uh, addressed and to give them access to their account, or if we need to follow on with a local site security person to make sure that everything's cleared up before we give them access. Um, so some of the other uh, fundamental communication methods for uh, information sharing when it comes to incident response is we have our mailing list. We have an uh, operational security mailing list. So this is uh, to just communicate day-to-day -day project tasks and meeting information. So there's nothing really that's sensitive or confidential in these communications, and that is a, a mailing list that's sent in the clear. It is a restricted or it's a controlled uh, subscriber list to those that are affiliated with the security team or are funded by Seed for Security. Then the second one is our incident announce list. And this is one that we typically uh, use a shared passphrase for encryption, encrypted communication. We'll announce the weekly incident response calls and also share information about active, ongoing uh, security and event uh, data on, these, on that list. And um, yeah, the subject line, we usually have uh, some guidance as to whether this is informational information in this email or if it's actionable. Actionable meaning we, you know, SPs want to read this as soon as possible and uh, possibly reply to the team to know whether or not they're affected or impacted and what steps they've taken to uh, address the security concern. And this is, of course, all this information is uh, shared on a need-to-know basis um, within the team. If anyone uh, would like to share this outside of the Exceed security team, they need to ask um, and get approval from um, the site that is supplying it. We also have a security contact list. This is on our secure wiki, and this lists all the contact information for the security staff. Email addresses, PGP fingerprints, so you know we can verify um, their signatures, uh, mobile information for their cell phones uh, for 24-7 access, and this is only available to the security team. And then finally, we have a Jabber chat service that we use for uh, coordinating information during these incident response calls and also ongoing just throughout the week. It's a chat room we'll leave open and you know, we'll share information about uh, new data breaches that may have you know, come across the, the wire or new vulnerability that might affect our community and or just people just looking for, for some additional eyes to, to give them advice on some type of activity that they've seen locally and you know, need some help to understand it. Um, so I mentioned uh, the uh, encrypted communications. We also, uh, like last week at the Exceed conference, we'll do a PGP key signing to verify that you know, uh, we're um, verifying that and signing the keys of our peers. I mentioned the use of sub uh, symmetric encryption for our mailing list. We did have a mailing list that used did the key management on its own. Uh, unfortunately, the funding ran out and it was no longer supported, so we're just using a shared passphrase. It seems to work very well. Uh, the secure wiki to, for our archival information. And I also uh, want to emphasize how important it is to make sure that you record uh, security events and the outcomes of them and you make them available so that in the future, when you see similar activity, you can say, oh yeah, we had this happen before. Uh, what was, you know, how did we resolve this or what control did we put in place and why did this work or not work this time? So having that archival information can really give you a, a breadth of, of experience that you can call upon uh, when things are, are you know, in, when you really need to make decisions quickly. 
And then, of course, finally, you know, how important, I can't emphasize, encrypted communications can be. If a com email is compromised from one of your team, you know, your adversary could have, a could have access to all of your communications. So it's very important you do that. Um, another activity that we get involved with is vulnerability management. So, you know, whether it's uh, shell shock or Heartbleed, uh, the security team will conduct a review, try to assess the impact and, admit it, and, and uh, propose a mitigation strategy. But we don't do this uh, in isolation. We um, work with other departments within the Exceed project, you know, that are much closer to the technology and the services that are being used. Um, and I'll show you the, the, this is a diagram of how this uh, normally works. When we have identified a vulnerability, we involved our oper operations team, our software team, SDNI, which is a software design and integration, and our gateways group. And we notify them of, of this vulnerability and make a suggestion on, on how to address it. And within 24 hours, we ask them to, to let us know whether or not they're impacted by this. Or, you know, this is software that we don't use or we're already patched. And uh, we have that 24-hour response period. After we get the involvement of all of those groups, we then uh, we'll write an advisory, and then we send it out to Exceed Wide. We've got all the mailing lists there you can see. And that will also, depending upon the importance, if it's one that affects users, we could include it on the message of the day for users when they log in, or uh, note it on the portal when they log in. Uh, we did this for Heartbleed. Some of the more high-profile um, vulnerabilities that, that uh, make the press, usually you know you want to have something about them on the, on the website. So people acknowledge or they can say, oh, yes, I heard about this, and it looks like uh, Exceed is on top of it. So this is the process we use for assessing um, uh, vulnerabilities and, and uh, strategies to mitigate um, their impact on the project. Um, just a little brief um, data point. The vast majority of our security incidents come from users or researchers that have compromised credentials. Uh, thank, luckily, you know, we have um, um, had a pretty good record so far when it comes to not having a significant security event. Uh, but we do have, uh, a, in waves it seems, we have a number of compromised user credentials. And that really takes the bulk of our uh, cycles when it comes to dealing with security issues. And these are either from phishing attempts or password reuse, uh, and just trying to nail down an account to make sure that we've um, addressed uh, and secured that account before we give them access is, takes up the majority of our time. But I thought that was kind of interesting, uh, which really emphasizes the need for having a strong training program for your end users, which is why we do these annual training programs at the Exceed conferences. Whoops. Um, so let me just talk about some of the defenses that we have within the Exceed program. At the service provider level, uh, most service providers, you know, they have their own monitoring. Uh, they probably, uh, most of them have their own intrusion detection system, whether that's Bro or Snort or some other uh, commercial product. And they also have an instant response team. So at the service provider level, we have um, these tools in place to be able to identify uh, when there's a security event that we need to respond to. Um, I mentioned also earlier that we require two-factor authentication for all privileged access to exceed resources. So um, um, you know, if you're going to SU or you need to have uh, root on a box, you need to have that two-factor in addition to your exceed credential. Um, uh, currently we use, uh, uh, we don't use Duo for that currently. We're using a uh, different vendor, RSA. Um, so all of our admins are required to use two-factor for um, exceed resources. Uh, we also require all of our service providers to be members of REN ISAC. And this just makes it easier for us to, to share information that we read about on the REN ISAC list. You know, the information sharing guidelines, um, you know, that they have, there's uh, strict information sharing, sharing guidelines. So by having everyone a member of the REN ISAC organization, it just makes communication a lot easier for us. Uh, we also require that uh, at the exceed level, so what I've talked about thus far has been at the service provider level. At the exceed level, we have vulnerability auditing and scanning. So we're using a commercial service called Qualys, which uh, you may know of. Um, and we use this for remote vulnerability scanning for all of our core services. 
and we review these scans uh, uh, weekly. And if we have one that um, has failed to be addressed within two weeks' uh, time, we submit a ticket on our security operations call, and we ask a representative from that SP to follow up on it. And it's been very successful for us and has works very well, um, very thorough. And also at the exceed level, I mentioned uh, numerous times here about our information security training that we do for new users. So those are some of the tools that we have in our uh, defense strategy. Uh, the training that I mentioned for new users, here's some of the topics we, we touch upon, just sec basic security awareness. I think a lot of users don't understand, you know, why are they a target? Why would a hacker want, uh, you know, my computer or my data or my network connection? Uh, social engineering, we talk about phishing, email and instant messaging, how to instruct them to um, you know, identify URLs that are embedded within emails to understand where they're really going and uh, verify. Um, password management, we give them some guidance on you know, strong passwords. Uh, also recommend you know, some uh, tools for password management uh, as a way to, to um, be able to keep track and maintain uh, strong passwords. Uh, we talk about data encryption and protection. A lot of our people in our uh, community are professors or researchers that have access to student data, which is under FERPA uh, regulations. Um, some researchers are dealing with um, NIH uh, genomic data, you know, which has dbGaP regulations. So just trying to raise their awareness about uh, how to protect their data. Of course, mobile devices are becoming more and more um, in use in our community, so giving some guidance on, on how to properly use mobile devices. Um, social networking, you know, how so many places are using security questions that can, uh, where the answers can be gleaned from going to Facebook or going to LinkedIn to find your first high school, um, you know, where you met your spouse. So just making sure people are aware of that. And then finally, um, instructing them on how to report a security incident to exceed. You know, for example, if they lose their laptop, give us a call. Uh, if you suspect that your machine has been compromised or if you get a notice from someone else saying that uh, your account has been compromised, to let us know, give us a heads up so we can keep an eye on their uh, account activity a little bit closer. So that's some of the topics we address in our training overview. Uh, and I see we have a question here from uh, Stephanie regarding Qualys. Uh, what server availability 345 are you having SPs address? We have uh, service providers address level four and five. Um, those are the thresh. That's the threshold for getting on our, our um, bad list. Uh, and then I got a question from Nick. Uh, how is all this coordinated with their campuses telling them? Uh, good question, Nick. Um, you know, it, it's, it seems to, my experience has been we've got many organizations or universities that have a really good central information security office that do their own education and awareness campaigns. How much of that reaches end users? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not in a position to measure. I will say, though, that with the training that I give every year at the Exceed Conference, um, we do get, I do get a lot of interactions. So at the end of the session, there's a lot of questions, which makes me believe that this is not old news to them. They are engaged, and it's something they're absorbing, and they're ask, asking questions about. Um, so I think it is, is valuable for them. Um, I, Nick, I think you were asking about the training versus the Qualys. Uh, with the Qualys, you know, that's obviously something Exceed, Exceed pays for. Um, Okay, correct, correct, excellent. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, I think I'm getting close to the end here. So let me just talk about some of the um, future projects that we're going to be working at, uh, working with within the Exceed project. Um, one of the things we've not done to date, but we realize there, you know, would be quite useful, is uh, coming up with a registry for bad SSH keys. So. Uh, for SSH keys that may have been exposed during a uh, security incident, uh, having just a, a list that we can share among the different service providers to say, these were exposed, don't trust them, that we could then go and check um, our systems to make sure that no users are, are, you know, have used them redundantly in different locations. Uh, so this is a way for us to share information about bad fingerprints, bad credentials. The other topic is federated intelligence sharing. 
So I mentioned how each one of these service providers have their own uh, intrusion detection system or their own network security monitors. They're all independent right now, and the way that we share information is manually on these weekly incident response calls and through our mailing list and our secure wiki. So there is a level of overhead. It's not instantaneous, but one of the projects we're looking, um, we're working on right now and hope to deliver within the next year or two is a model that would allow uh, the Exceed um, uh, service providers to share information in real time. And this is going to be based upon uh, the SIFT framework that uh, came out of um, uh, Internet2 and the Rena ISAC that they use for uh, intelligence sharing. So this is something that we're just trying to start at a very low level to say, you know, here's the type of activity we're seeing. Allow us to tag it and say, you know, this was a brute force attack or this was, um, um, you know, a, a stolen credential that was being used or this is a DDoS attack. And this would allow sites to say, I'd like to pick this information or, uh, you know, I noticed that PSC seems that their feed, their intelligence feed really seems to uh, mirror what I experience here at NCSA. So we're going to subscribe to their feed and allow people to make decisions upon, uh, you know, what they want to do locally. Do they just want to alert when they notice some activity or do you want to automatically put it into a black hole, you know, and, and black hole this type of traffic? So we're still in the very, very, very early stages of this, but it's something that I think is, uh, I'm very excited about, and I think it'll give us a, a real insight on the type of threats that we're seeing as a, within the Exceed project as a whole. Okay, I think that's about all that I had. I just want to direct you to the security page on the Exceed uh, website. It's www.exceed.org slash security. And if you have any questions about my presentation today or would like more information, uh, please don't hesitate to drop me an email. Uh, my email is uh, jam, J-A-M, at psc.edu. And with that, I will just take a pause and field any other questions that people have. So Jim, if you don't mind, I'll jump in and go over some news and, high, and updates uh, in, in case people want to type in a question. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So, of course, uh, we want to thank everyone for attending this webinar. And again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the box while we have time available. And also, uh, one thing that we're starting that's kind of new with this project is uh, we want to get some feedback from those of you who are attending the webinars. So if you wouldn't mind taking our survey, uh, unfortunately, it's not hyperlinked in this little pod here. Uh, hope, hopefully you guys can see the pod. Uh, but you'll have to copy and paste it into your browser. So uh, we would really appreciate any feedback that you could give us, and including we would appreciate some suggested topics that you'd like to hear about. Oh, th yeah, thank you. That's that's a good idea, Jim. Uh, you can see the link here in the chat is now hyperlinked. Uh, other things. Uh, we have a reminder that the, um, the NSF Summit is coming. So for those of you who are attending, uh, if you're already registered, that's great. Uh, make sure you get your travel arrangements figured out. It's uh, coming up August 16th through 18th. And Arlington, Virginia. Uh, unfortunately, if you are not registered, registration is closed. So <laughs> uh, we can't, uh, we're not adding, well, Amy and Vaughn are typing, so maybe they have some more updated comments about that. Yeah, we do have a waiting list, and if we do get cancellations, we can uh, go through that waiting list. But uh, as Amy just pointed out, if you are registered, uh, the deadline for making your hotel reservation is this Friday to get the conference rate. After Friday, it'll probably raise to some ungodly number that they can get in the DC area. So if you're coming, book your hotel by the end of the week. Great. And then uh, we've got someone typing, so I'll keep going through this list here. Uh, to view presentations to uh, to join our discuss mailing list or submit requests to present, you could visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Uh, Stephanie asks, 
hi, will you be streaming any of the upcoming summit at sessions? Uh, yeah, we, we, so we, we will not be streaming anything from the summit, unfortunately. There's um, a number of issues that come up with that cost is one, getting cameras. Uh, what we will be making available, though, is the training material and the presentations will be available online. Um, so if you go to the summit page on trustedci.org, if we can get that in the chat room, uh, you'll see the program agenda. And we, we intend to publish all the presentations we can with the permission of the uh, presenters. So at least we'll have the slide set, but it's something uh, for us to consider in the future. Thanks, Stephanie. And Stephanie, one thing that we are hoping to do uh, next month is to have an encore presentation of one of the previous uh, presentations that occurred just the week before at the summit. So uh, the goal is uh, to have a, a presentation August 22nd at 11 Eastern time, and it'll be an encore presentation from the NSF summit. So at least one of those presentations will be um, available next, next month, Stephanie. And if uh, we get enough feedback from uh, the surveys from the summit and also from the webinars, we would uh, be happy to approach the other presenters from the summit and see if they would be uh, willing to present at a future webinar, CTSC webinar. Sorry, Steph Stefan. <laughs> OK. Uh, I think we have covered all of our web, or, uh, excuse me, all of our summit-related news. Again, if you want to. Uh, to join our mailing list, or if you want to receive more information about these upcoming webinars, uh, please go to our website at trustedci.org slash webinars. And um, with that, I just want to thank everybody again for attending this session. And if you know anyone who would be interested in watching this uh, after we're done uh, recording it, we will be posting it online later, and we will be uh, sending the link around. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.